Okay, recording. We've already started. got a question. Yeah, we already do. So let's. John, you want to start taking questions? You and Ron in that? I can take the first one. How often should we run update statistics on sys databases like sysadmin, etc.? Daily? Never? I would hope it wouldn't be daily. I don't know. It seems like a once a week or once a month kind of thing to me personally. Maybe uh, I don't know if it would help if you guys just make sure that we know who's answering. Oh, this is JC. Thanks. Sorry. Um, would any of the SQL folks disagree with that? I mean, sis, I suppose it depends on how large sysadmin grows, but uh, that's the only database I can think of growing, system database that I can think of really growing. Doesn't seem important to update statistics on that guy very often to me. I guess no one disagrees. I can't hear you, Karen. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, it looks like uh, people are having trouble unmuting themselves. Could have all kinds of people disagreeing with me, and I just would never know. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> yeah, Andreas says he can't unmute himself. That's why they. That's why they ask the questions, JC. I think they just want to to get your opinion and argue with you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So Mark says, depend on depends on the size of and usage. Oh, I got my audio back. This is Andrea speaking. Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yes, I guess the answer is correct. That has been given. It really depends, as every other database, it depends on the usage, truly. Really. So, uh, we, I believe we have a, um, a task in sysadmin, which is probably not perfect, but at least it can give you an estimate uh, or a, a guess at or a recommendation which um, tables should get um, should get an update statistics. The problem is that this task usually excludes the system databases and system databases are considered to be all oh, this are starting with uh, sys uh, in their name. So, um, but basically it, it goes down to uh, every other usage of update statistics which means that we should do that when uh, we have a considerable amount of changes within the database. That would be my quick guess here. Yeah, this, this is Mark. We, uh, we capture lots and lots of SQL trace data and uh, with additional indexes and with, but without update stats, it's, it's treacherous trying to get to the data. So uh, <laughs> I, I purge the data off as I can, but we still have thousands and thousands of SQLs every hour, and uh, that's hard to mine um, against sysadmin without update stats. Yeah. yeah so that's that does sound like a niche uh, usage, though. But yes, I, I could see that being being an issue. So are you also so you are you are collecting um, many data in this sysadmin database, and you're querying it um, with a Higher frequency. Is this am I understanding correct? Uh, not a high. The query is not a high frequency, but the amount of data is mm -hmm. is enough that even when I do go to look for a specific time frame, if I haven't uh, either purged some of the data off and or ran update stats, it's uh, it's brutally slow. Mm -hmm. But and I know why. It's also those tables are not fragmented. That's something I probably would hope I'd never have to do in sysadmin. But but uh, but yeah, that's why. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, next is from Vicente. It's not even a question, but uh, sincere thank you. This is the first conference in years I've seen a deep 
slash kernel slash core work and good roadmap to make big improvements to Informix. New ER performance features, new planet, page, row ID, plan changes, etc. So I guess he's just, Vicente's just happy. That's our goal. <laughs> Here's another question or uh, from Mark. If mining data from there, what? If mining data from there isn't very important. Oh, never mind. I think that's a comment to the last one. All right. So John Dargins wants to know, do we really need to fix in-place alters before doing the Informix 14 upgrade? The instructions for fixing the in-place alters is rather confusing and the method for fixing them described doesn't actually seem to work. Also, querying the system tables related to the tables needing in-place alters seems to take an inordinately long time. So I don't know who wants to address that one. I think that Pronto had, <clears throat> had this same question and we, and there was a confusion on their part about whether they had to update in place alters before upgrading and we told them no. Um, I forget where they had gotten that that message. But um, I think it was we it turned out to be a problem in um, reversion, not in conversion. Or a potential problem in in reversion if they needed to go back um, and they had done up in place alters in the new version. It wasn't a case where they had to update in place alters to move forward. I'll take the next one. Where can okay. I download Informix 14 to test it? On the IBM website or where? There is a trials and download site where the developer edition is. So um, that's where you can download uh, the developer edition from. I can try to find the website and put it in the chat. Yeah, and at the moment you already ha also have the ability to download the Docker image from Docker Hub at least until end of this year, I would guess, because Docker changed their uh, account policy. But yeah, there you can find ready to go Docker images if you just want a quick testing without having to install something. It does look like Jan may have posted the URL further down in the chat if somebody wants to double check that maybe. Uh, Jan had posted something, Carlton and Scott did, yeah. Uh, there's, there, there's several, there's several links. Yes. Yeah. Tomas has a question. With the ever-growing data and the necessity of increasing the internal limits, rows and page and pages and partitions, JC, this has your name on it. Have you considered to improve the tools around to be more performant? Like we implement the DB export, DB import to use external tables and be able to parallelize the operation. Data moving tools is definitely something that um, we've had on our list to improve. Um, I can't promise exactly what we're going to do for VNext in that area, but it's it's definitely um, something we talk about a lot and consider a lot and it's it's on the list. I wish I could tell you what we have for for concrete plans there, but I do not think that we have anything set in stone. I don't know if you can think of anything Karen that we're doing for um migration tools that we definitely have on the Vnext list. But as you know, we we talk about it a lot. That's right. I I can't think of anything right now, but we we're aware that that's an issue because um, for a lot of the things that we want to do, it would be it would be very helpful for us not to have to uh, do in place conversions. 
And in order to ask customers not to do in place conversions, we would need some. Some quick and easy way of moving data around. <clears throat> it's just a matter of whether we have the bandwidth to do both at the same time, but we, we, we consider it very important. Okay, I'm going to move back up the list to a question we missed. This is from VJ. Is it okay to disable built in sensors like mon underscore profile, mon underscore table underscore profile if the user is not using the data? I think I got this question recently, and fr was it from? Who asked that? Qu Sorry, Rhonda. Who just asked that question? J. VJ. VJ. Yeah. D did you ask me this question a week or so ago, VJ? Well, anyway, um, my answer at the time was I wasn't certain. It, did, it certainly didn't sound like something that was problematic to do to disable them. I wasn't 100% certain. And at the time, um, we were able to punt on the question, but I think we would have to get back to you on whether it's 100% safe. It doesn't sound unsafe to me to disable them. Okay, so go ahead. Next one is table level restore via art checker. Had a known bug on the AIX last time they tried to use it. Has this been fixed? I do not know. Does anybody here know? Can you can maybe can you describe the nature of the bug a little bit? Arc. Or actually, if you have a bug number. Oh, Mark can't unmute himself. I just did. Isn't technology fun? <laughs> We're going to be in person someday soon, guys, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. I, I can't, uh, I don't, the, the, an ANX specific art checker bug doesn't ring a bell with me. I don't know if it does with anyone else in the call. Not with me as well. So if anyone has more details about it, then we can look it up. But without that, it's a little bit difficult to tell. Yes, me. I knew it was a general question. I'll just try it again. It was a couple of years ago, so. Uh, yeah. Okay, couple couple of years ago gives us a good chance that this specific let, let me, one is let me, fixed. Let me just say, I, it was a known bug, and the answer was it doesn't work. No, that's okay. I I can try it again. Our checker didn't work at all. Uh, for the TLR, the TLR at least on okay, AIX. Yeah, and that was on uh, that, that was probably on eleven five or early twelve. Oh God, I hope that's fixed by now. I uh, yeah, it, I'll, I'll 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 try it. It'll probably be fastest. Yeah, let's hope. Yeah. And if not, <laughs> let's, if not, please let us know. Any more? Come on, guys. Actually, VG, I can comment on your um, the limited space in root DBS doing in place upgrades. That's been a problem dating way back, and I don't know if it's being addressed or not, but I've I asked that at conferences many times in the four to five year time frame. Does anybody know if that's been addressed? The the fact that you need to have a much bigger root DBS than otherwise necessary to do an in place upgrade. It used to be that all chunks had to come out, uh, all extents had to come out of chunk one, but that was a long time ago. That's is that what's happening? It's that it's an older version, so that's what's happening. Well, that it's I it, mean it, back in the day it was probably going from eleven seven to twelve one was what I remember it, it from, um, and I don't know what was happening. Well, just no root DBS would fill up and the thing would stop, and you'd have to you know just you know go back yeah and try it again. 
uh, and it's not, that's been around for years, and I thought by now it might have been addressed, but maybe not. I'm trying to think of what would have been filling it up during a uh, during a migration. I mean, obviously, if you can make the chunk make some chunk in root DBS extendable or allow the space to be expanded during you know by the by the storage pool, that would be ideal. What needs that space though? I'm not sure. Um, you're pretty sure it was going from 1170 to 1210. Yeah, that's part of the time frame. I don't think it went back farther than that, but yeah, that's still many years ago. And Tom Beebe just put a note in the chat. I had it going to echo to V12 when there was less than 100 meg available in root DBS. And that's kind of the recollection I have too, but it's been years. I remember this level three had this this exact problem when they went from 11 to 12, but I don't remember what it was. I think yeah. the way we tended to address that kind of problem in general was with better restartable migration, um, conversion guard and such, rather than try to figure out every possible way this could go wrong. I think we, we tended to fix it sort of generally, try to fix it generally. I don't know what exactly was going wrong there, but. And I understand you know, my that fix was, um, my fix was to add an unnecessary 1 gig chunk to root DBS every time I did a in place upgrade. <laughs> and of course, once it's there, it's there for good. So it just kind of wasted space. That's that was the biggest annoyance of it. Well, it, I know it's not possible in all cases, but if if it's a, if you've got a cooked file in root DBS and you can make it extendable, then we'll. We'll tend to only extend it as needed. So, it, although it will get bigger. And you won't necessarily need that space in the future. It will will minimize the amount by which we expand the space that way. Makes sense. Okay, we have another one from Vicente. It's really difficult to understand how contention disk memory or CPU switches is affecting a large install performance. Are there any real statistics about how many times Informix is waiting, waiting for Mutex and why? That's a big topic. It, is it is, uh, Vladimir on the call? <laughs> Can he, you wanna, do you dare comment on that? I was thinking of uh, Q stats and weight stats. There's a uh, two on config parameters that you can enable to to see that, so you can see, you know, how long a particular mutex has contention and things like that. But, um, you know, it doesn't give you the whole story. It just kind of gives you a glimpse into which mutexes might be hot, which ones have the largest queues, and which have the longest waits. Um, some of them are specifically labeled to make it easy, like the log latch or something like that. But if it's other types of mutex, then it, then there's a little more investigation you've got to take. Since that question came from Vicente, I'm assuming that um, all existing features have been used here. So I was wondering if if Vladimir had any tricks that um, wouldn't necessarily be known by most of us. Um, I guess I'd ask Vicente if if you can send me an email. About a specific scenario, um, it might be easier to try to figure out if there's more we can do here on our end. Thanks. Uh, Jesse, would, would you think on that SG top would be something that could? help to shed light on this and if we change uh, already had tried it maybe well on set the sg top doesn't show mutex weights it sounds like he's it sounds like he's asking for something pretty specifically yeah. drilled down and on set the sg top is more uh you know mid the 10,000 foot level yeah at least you would only see probably the the effect, not the cause. Right, uh, right. Mm -hmm. 
maybe I can still chime in here. So the, the current outputs that we have for mutex is uh, basically only are for, for what is currently uh, being used and, and, and locked, but what those mutex systems don't have are any statistical counters or so number of, of being locked and, and time spent being locked. So that might maybe be uh, useful in that respect. Possible. Um... So um, it's, maybe it, it sounds like something that it sounds like something that might be expensive to do all the time, and it would tend to. I think a lot in a lot of cases it would. Uh, it would raise some red herrings, so we have yeah. to think about it. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. Look, this Vicente did reply down in the chat. Yep, onstat dash g spi doesn't explain real con contentions. And then Scott looks like he replied on stat dash G W A I. Now that's that dash G S P I has never been particularly useful to me. I don't know if Vladimir has ever used it for anything important. It's possible that we could revisit the whole idea of S P I. <clears throat> It can be useful to to determine a hot spin lock, and and you will then see it when we already determined it. And you will will have to fix the, the defect. So it has been useful already by the time you get to work on this. I, I use but SPI. I, I do use uh, answer minus G SPI a lot, but I I don't see any shortcomings in this. And and this is not not about mutexes, but about spin latches. And you you don't feel like SPI showing a hot latch is ninety percent of the time working as designed. Ninety nine percent of the time. It definitely is working as as designed, but but it could point to a, a potential bottleneck under certain conditions. So spin locks always work as designed, <laughs> but being a bottleneck <laughs> cannot be part of the design. <laughs> I find SPI pretty useful. Oh, that's good. John, did you want to get the next one? Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry if we're getting a little behind the questions here. I can't really see much of the chat. No, I meant John, John Fahey, because we were like alternating, but I got it. Uh, this is from uh, Sent Hanyu. Sorry. I botched that. Connection manager question using ER. Running in Formix 1410, the ER is configured with an update anywhere. Running on two nodes in two different locations, two different data centers. The requirement is to restrict all application connections, go to the primary node at any given time. Only in case of database failure on the primary the application should automatically connect to the secondary DB node and continue to work. Using Connection Manager, what is the best SLA type you recommend to achieve the above? It might, that's a long one, sorry. So that implies, even though it's update anywhere, that only one side at any particular point in time is receiving the updates from the application. So that would be the primary. And the other one, the secondary. And in the event of a role switch, the connection manager should be smart enough to know which service having which role. And I think those servers are, from the connection manager's perspective, they are the same. So that there is no primary secondary attribute to those ER servers. I would not know how the connection manager could make a decision here. So it would have to sense which one is currently receiving uh, the, the application traffic. Is that roughly the question? So that 
that would be a, a load criteria. So the server with the biggest load should also receive a new load because that must be the active one. I don't think we have a, a, a rule prepared for this. All right, here's the next one. This is from VJ. If low underscore memory underscore MGR is enabled, and if application is using connection pooling, how does the killing of idle sessions work in that scenario? Using connection pooling in the sense that on the back end, there's one session that's that's being fanned into by multiple multiple directions. Um, if so, it, you know the killing of that. We're not going to be able to distinguish between the clients and this one session they're all using. Yeah. Um, yeah. If I may. But uh, most of the connection pooling is handled on the client side. So every client, JDBC, .NET, ODBC, those are the ones who do the connection pooling. And the way that they handle the idle is usually creating a timer thread. And that will, whenever the connection is free, so when the application closed the connection, the, uh, the Time the application, the time that the connection was created uh, is checked, and depending on the age of the application, it will go back to the pool, and it also have uh, another timer thread that checks for the age of those connections in the pool. So the serve, uh, the client doesn't really have any control or any knowledge of how much resources that application is using in the server side. And usually, as soon as the application will close uh, that connection, the driver, JDBC, ODBC, whatever, it will free all the resources uh, used by that session on the engine side. So usually, it shouldn't really hit that low memory manager. Javier, it sounds like low memory manager is not necessarily a good fit with connection pooling. Would you agree? Because it's it's going to be only looking that feature is only going to be looking at the session and its resources. And so it could kill a session that a big pool is using and there could be 1 client responsible for a lot of resources, but it's going to kill. The session that a, that a bunch of clients are using. Uh, yeah, but that session it's, I mean, but the client. Usually does the uh, driver, not the application, the driver that. Uh, is being used JDBC or .NET or whatever. It is the one in charge of releasing the resources that that application is using. As soon as so, for example, we have recently put it in ODBC. Uh, we have implemented a connection pool inside the ODBC driver, and the first thing that uh, the driver will do when it detects that the application has closed that connection is uh, do a call to release all the statements and all the cursors and everything else that that application has done within that session. And of course, that goes to the server and the server should release whatever resources that it take from that particular session. So, the, I mean, as far so as that, that's, yeah. the, that's in the best case, but in a, in a problem case, it's possible that the set the back end session will be killed by the feature and it will affect a, a, an entire pool. Correct. Yes, but I wouldn't really see a difference if pool is enabled or not. So if the server will kill one session because it has reached that low memory manager, uh, it, it doesn't matter if that session was in a uh, belongs to a pool or not, because oh. it will happen the same if the pool was disabled. So if have one one session and pool is off, so the application connect uh, creates a connection, uh, get that connection from the server. That application during the use of that particular session, it used 
a lot of memory and the server decides to kill it. So that will happen. It doesn't really matter if that connection uh, belongs to a pool or not. Okay. This one about so, remote users CFG. If a host name plus user pair is listed here, Informix will let the user from that host log in, even if that user account on the DB host is expired or locked. The existence of the account on the DB host is just enough. Is that really how the trusted user should be perceived? Isn't that a security hole? Good question. Sounds like a question for Dave if he's available. I'm here. I'm looking at it. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm not. We, we have never by default, and this is part of a problem that I'd like to work on, but we have never dealt with uh, accounts being expired or locked. The only thing that we do is we look at the password hash and the thing you supplied and verify that it's correct. Having said that, though, this appears to be a trusted question. And if you're uh, if you're setting up a trusted situation between a, a uh, user uh, machine and a host machine, um, and you have it trusted, then we're not going to do any other kind of authentication. Right. I mean, that's your, if you want something different, um, you can use some sort of a uh, PAM service or something that will verify that an account is not expired or locked. That didn't answer your question. Um, just put something back up in the, in the chat and we'll. We'll get to it. Uh, Ron and I are kind of going through the chat um, from oldest to newest, and we'll catch up eventually. I'm glad to see all these questions. Um, Mark, I think your question was asked about I spy. Um, so I think I'm going to drop that unless you want to, unless you need some need to know something else about I spy. I just, I just assume it's not going to get resurrected ever. I'm, I'm just kind of reminiscing. <laughs> You like that, JC? I I don't have. I'm not anticipating it being resurrected. No. <laughs> hey, Rhonda, you want to do the next one? Uh, sure. Uh, looks like okay. the next one's from John. Wants to know what aspect of Informix version 14 will provide the greatest benefit to customers. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, are you doing? It could be ER improvements. Yeah, I was just thinking that, JC. It really depends on what you use in house, but the ER performance improvements, the simplification of ER setup. Um, there's quite a few things that were added with security that everybody always likes and needs. Being able to take archives on an RSS, it, it depends on your needs, I guess, but those are some of the ones we can think of. Break back to Tomas's question about sound like the security question that we talked about with um, users and stuff. Uh, he poses, then why do we care about the account existence at all? For a for a uh, root based server, whenever you do anything um, that affects that touches the operating system, you do it as that user, and so it's critical that that user exists on that machine.
right? That's that's part of the security. So you're not doing things as Informix or Root. You're doing it as your user. And would you would you be able to impersonate that user if the user is expired or locked? Wouldn't that call then fail? No. No. As a matter of fact, you can uh, just from an OS level, not from an Informix level. From an OS level, you can run a process as any user ID. There doesn't even need to be a username. Right. So there's no authentication at that point. It is root starting up a process that runs as that user. Yes, when you, I'm reading the thing here, but when you run a system command, you're acting as the user you're logged in as. Or uh, for the uh, case of like a database user, you have to associate a system user with it. But for what it's worth, the comment from Thomas there, <clears throat> the the there is an ability uh, or, or a a maybe a benefit to having an account that's locked that you can't log in as, but you can use as a database user. So it depends on which side of that you're looking at. So I think we're all caught up with the existing questions. So keep typing. Wait, here's somebody. I might have a weird sounding question here. Please don't get me wrong. Well, maybe I should read this one first before I read it out loud. Uh, I'm pretty sure that all of us here love Informix and know what it is capable of. But what is, in your opinion, the number one biggest weakness of Informix? Something you'd like to change or fix ASAP? Be it a complex issue or not? <laughs> yeah, I like those. Uh, yeah, it's a race. <laughs> yeah. Marketing, marketing. marketing. <laughs> I think we, on on our end, we 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 complain for years about marketing, but yeah. I, I think that we have to stop doing that. I think that we, in the last couple couple three years, we've talked a lot about how to make it, our back ends more attractive to new developers. I think that may be one of our biggest weaknesses is that new developers don't know about us or find us difficult to love. And that is one of the things we are, are working hard to change. And something we definitely need to fix if we want to, you know, if we want to grow our business. Developer delight is the is the topic that Karen is the category that on Karen's um, presentation that relates to that. Sente through an extendable smart blobs. And Scott Pickett through in product limits. Yeah. But from a as the kernel representative, I I definitely think that. Um, Product limits in the kernel are a, a major issue too, but from an overall perspective, I would say developer delight is really the th the, the biggest thing we need to uh, work on. Got one. It's uh, if you come up, if you came up. This is a short, this is a long one. Basically, what is the best storage manager? <laughs> PSM, HT, Commvault, Veritas, IBM Spectrum project. The one that you have, I would say. Do they, I mean, that's that's the thing. Do, if they all do, they all work. I guess they do. But they don't all they don't all meet the same meet the same needs though. Yeah. So yeah, that depends on way too many things. I think. Sorry, I don't mean yeah, to answer. 
no, for I... usually that, that that's an, an enterprise decision anyway and not one yeah not an informic specific one is there okay so my question to the panelists is is there a storage manager that is particularly that we think of as particularly problematic i i don't know of one internally we use psm because it's just easy um i would say we We've seen most people using Veritas, but um, I don't know. I don't know if that makes it the best one. Is there one that anyone can think of that is particularly difficult for us? We had lots of trouble with TSM for many years, um, but that seems to have settled on AIX. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if we can answer that question very well. Gustavo might have a better idea, but I don't think he's here. <laughs> Shall we move on? Yep. So what what is the maximum number of database instances can be configured and monitored? By HQ, you must you must say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I need um, to run HQ always in the Windows system? Is there any known security slash firewall restrictions? Since, uh, yeah, this is Linesh here. Since HQ is a Java program, it uh, need not necessarily only run on Windows. It can run on any OS. So there is no restriction that HQ should always be running on Windows. And uh, it is designed uh, to add any number of database instances, but we haven't uh, tested it for a very, very, very large uh, number of instances. So I think um, your setup, I think 500 VMs, uh, I think it, it, it will work on that by adding those many uh, instances in the HQ. So does that answer your question, Santanu? So Linesh, internally we've tested, it. what's the maximum we've tested? Uh, we had tested around, I think, uh, by adding multiple instances. Uh, we have tested around uh, 300 or something. Okay. What are the features of AGS Server Studio and Sentinel Server compared to Informix HQ? Studio. GS Server Studio and Sentinel Server compared to HQ. Because you guys just work at HQ, so you might not know what's out there specifically on other products, but maybe someone out there does. Um, Server Studio and Sentinel are behind on a couple of big features, but they've it's always been supported uh, over the years. But I would imagine HQ will take over at some point, I would hope. Someone has counted HQ is free. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, we haven't compared as such with, with other products uh, for HQ, but yeah, we are focusing on, on implementing more features so that it is easier to manage and monitor uh, Informix from HQ. Next so this, one is wrong. Can I see it we skipped the question. Migration. I'm sorry. It, we see. missed Barry's question. Yeah. Sorry. We have a client who recently implemented SHA-256 passwords, and we've set up PAM access for connections. Our software vendor wants to bypass user ID slash password entry on DB access. Is that possible with PAM? So. Let me take a shot at this. Uh, first of all, I'm going to presume that this is uh, AIX because that's the only place where this uh, SHA hash for passwords really matters. And that's because IBM botched that up. But at any rate, um, the, the issue here is you can, what you can't do is you can't determine the name of the client that's trying to connect in the PAM service. 
So you can't bypass user ID password just because it's DB access. I mean, DB access is just another CSDK tool, but you can, uh, you can allow connections without passwords in PAM. I mean, you can check whatever you want to check that's available to check, but you can't check the name of the client software. Okay. You you may have to define your own PAM service that's something closer to our hosts or something where you're allowed to connect without passwords. Or our login, I guess. If I didn't answer that, I can, if somebody wants to send me an email or something, I can try and do a better job. But Okay, it looks like Luis's, Lu Luis's question is next. In migration from 12.10 to 14.10 with ER replicates, I can use the script to migrate, but I had problems with the migration in the previous process, migration from 11.5 to 12.10. The SysCDR databases are different between versions. I had to carry out the method of deleting replicates and recreating replicates once the databases were migrated in little more than 80 installations throughout different offices in Mexico. Yesterday, in these sessions, I have seen that replicates of 12.10 and 14.10 work in both directions. Is the SysCDR database the same between these versions? Hey, this is Trini. I think uh, you know there is a, there is a difference in this CDR uh, database in terms of a couple of tables, but uh, uh, but I think uh, you know. In fact, Andreas is here. He is um, uh, he he can pay chime in and uh, the twelve ten between twelve ten and fourteen ten. I think uh, it should work on both directions. I don't see any issues. So uh, the replication between 12.10 and 14.10 is a, a different question than uh, from from whether you can simply upgrade from 12.10 to 14.10 uh, without modifying any anything in the CDR database. A replication between 12.10 and 14.10 works like a charm. There's there's no nothing blocking that. Uh, regarding the upgrade, I'm I'm not sure what is meant here uh, with the uh, the script. Uh, use the scripts to migrate. So um, the, the 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 upgrade procedure for uh, for an instance using ER is documented in the migration guide, and that includes uh, shutting down enterprise application before the upgrade, and then convert the SysCDR database. If there there was a schema change in CCDR in the new version before restarting enterprise application again, so that should be taken care of by by this concdr script in the informing steer etc con con directory. I think it is for for conversion reversion. So there is a utility, a, a script and a utility. I think that the script is to be executed and will then uh, use the utility for updating the CCDR schema, if there really was a difference. I think there was maybe only a minor difference between 12.10 and 14.10, except of course for 14.10 XC6, which brings that uh, uh, new uh, the, those new in row spool columns in the in the spool tables, and uh, that will not be taken care of by by that conversion script. But there uh, we explicitly uh, request that 
of course, you would bring down ER before mag migration. You would stop explicitly, so it's in a stopped state and, and remains stopped when you bring up the server in, in the new version. And then you not only start ER in 1410 XC6 or newer, but you have to run an explicit clean start. So the clean start will take care of, of that schema change by simply deleting or dropping those uh, spool tables and recreating them in the new schema. So and I, I think all that should have been true between 11.50 and 12.10 already. I'm not aware of, of what might not have been working there. I think uh, Karen and I at least heard this question at least once in the last couple of days about licensing and HQ. Could someone please clarify that if I copy the HQ directory from Informixter and port it to another server, how the licensing would work? It, it's a, a little unclear to San, Santanu, at least. And you want to take that on licensing? And and Jan has put something also just now into the into the chat about that. Uh, this is something that I have written down, and we'll take it offline, and we'll probably put something in like the IBM Informix community chat or so, um, something around you know a definitive answer on this. But I don't see it as a licensing issue. But um, I just have to double check. HQ is considered part of the server, so we should be able to do to do what you guys need to be done. Well, but don't we encourage to put HQ on a separate machine anyway? Yes, yes, and so yeah, if to copy it over to put it wherever, you know, there's a piece of it that needs to be with each of the servers. It, it should be able to be done any way you want to do it. But I just have to, if there's something we need to clarify in the license or, you know, just a text, it it's just something I'll take care of. I need to say, JC, you want to read what you just put in the chat? I know it took probably five minutes to type that out. <laughs> Maybe he's hiding. JC is not audible. Sorry. Uh, a couple <laughs> of minutes ago, when we were talking about uh, weak weaknesses in Informix, Vicente mentioned uh, quote extendable smart blobs. I think he was he may have been talking about the fact that we can't extend smart blob chunks, which is an issue because of uh, the overhead we need to calculate when we create the chunk in the first place. <clears throat> but I will. And, and this is not a promise, but I will say that we are entertaining a feature request by Vicente to store smart blobs outside of um, the chunks we manage and in a file system. And there are several advantages to that kind of feature. One, the one most important to his customer being faster archives. Obviously, if we aren't managing the smart blobs, somebody else has to, but uh, for for reasons specific to his customer, this is a sweet spot for them. They they would be happy to manage these smart blobs themselves in the file system. They store them for five or ten years and don't tend to query them. Um, so we're looking at this request. I, I can't say this is going to be in vNext or any part of it will be in vNext, but I can say that we are definitely entertaining the request. And that may um, that may take the edge off of some of the problems that people have with smart blobs. Uh, those then to be included in a backup? We would not be backing up the smart blobs ourselves, which would significantly speed our archive, and we would be relying on the customer to use file system backups, and they could use um, incremental backups that way more easily. Mm. Um, they could they would have to take care of their own replication, but there are ways to do that apparently. So um, we're looking at this. 
we cannot currently compress smart blobs, obviously, much to my chagrin. Um, they could be compressed at the file system level if we did it this way, et cetera. Question from John. If a company has 15 plus machines with Informix, dozens of databases, millions of rows, hundreds of employees, and 365 days per year operation, should the DBA be 100% focused on DBA activities, or should he also be able to spend 75% of his time doing programming activities? We should vote on this one. <laughs> Since, we're, since we we tend to be very good with uh, with cost of ownership, then we would say uh, DBA should be able to go on vacation anytime they want and program and do all kinds of other things. Spend time with their families, not spend all 100% of their time worrying about the database. But I'm not sure what the question is really driving at. It sounds like a, a conceptual. Um, question rather than all about calculating users and instances and databases. I think we all know that what Informix is. I mean, obviously, if if there's anything that we can do, if there's anything we can do to make DBA's lives better, we will try to do it. So if, if there's more, if there's more we can do, we will, we, we're, we're not resting on our laurels here. We, we would love to do that. So. Let the feature requests begin. <laughs> Look at them and we do, we do implement them. Uh, maybe we crash too little. That's the only, that's the last question I'm seeing here, unless I overlook somebody's question. John, do you see any? John Fahey, that is? I don't think so, unless we both slip past it. I mean, it's been, it's been a challenge to try to stay ahead and not get too far behind or whatever. Now, one of the things I would like to capture in I know that we've done this in surveys before is what versions of the server people are still on if they've moved up to 1410 if if they're still on 1210 I would I would love to have you guys put in the chat um what version you're on that might fill up the chat quite a bit but I would love it you know you can save it Karen right yeah. Whoever start, whoever's the real host can can save the contents of the chat. Yeah. Which I will be, John. That would be awesome. Yeah. Do we want to wind this thing up now then or a little early? I see had mentioned developer tools earlier. Um delighting the developer. Do you have any more high level info on that? What are you may have covered it in a different session, but I might I missed it. There are several things that we need to do to DB export to modernize it. Um, we have to decide whether to modernize the legacy tools or replace them, which is always a difficult decision. DB export is 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 behind at this point and would need to be uh, brought up to, up to date if we're going to keep using that tool. Um, it would be nice to modernize the parallel loader, but I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. We re unfortunately, we really don't have a good, even a good high level picture for anyone at this point, as far as I know. We just know that it's uh, giving us some angst. We've been relying on ER to do a lot of this lately because it's can be done it's something that can be done online. 
local loopbacks and that kind of thing. Anybody want to address what's in the chat now? Do we all agree that we need to do benchmarking before we decide whether to use compression on a given table or not? Just test compress it and see how much you save. I think that's all you need to do. I guess. I mean, it depends on whether you're I/O bound or CPU bound. Um, if you're I/O bound, compression is bound to help. If you're CPU bound, then Possibly not. So, yeah, I guess we'd agree that benchmarking, if you don't know whether you're CPU bound or IO bound, you probably should. But if you don't, then benchmarking probably would be pretty important. I think my, what might be being asked for is a tool that will do that for the uninitiated and, and, tell, and tell, the, you know, tell the end user. Tell the end user how much, how much their table will be compressed, or how much performance improvement they'll get. I, I guess really it's, it's both. You know, I, yeah, it's. That's, I, I would say it's a both. And I would say there's not going to be a tool that tells you how, what benefit, how much benefit you're going to get, because it does depend on very much on, as I said, whether you tend to be CPU bound or I/O bound. But I think that's the question that's being asked. There is a task for estimating compression, so. Yeah. There's a, another question from Vicente. Is there any known number of connection limit connection manager can handle? How many connections can one CM handle simultaneously? What is a connection in this in this context? Is it a new connection being redirected to a server, or is it a persistent proxy connection through the connection manager? So I I think. Um, are persistent ones. Well, I think there's not a lot to do for for the connection manager once the connection is established. And and if, if the the amount of new connection new connections is is the question, then um, I think you can handle that with multi with with more workers in the connection manager. Yeah, you you mean the connection manager would become a bottleneck? Wow. I think Carlton wants to speak. Can he? Can I so it's it's a problem of too many concurrent new connections. While that that problem would probably the be the same as on the engine, because those connections, well, they might even have to be received now on on two levels, on the connection manager and on the on the server side. This is Carlton. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I I think. We need a little bit more information as as he was saying, the connection manager can function in 2 different roles. 1 is a proxy and the other whereby the connection manager becomes part of the entire communication string. So the session connects to the connection manager and then to the database and the connection manager is always in that connection string. And then there is non proxy mode. Where the client connects to the connection manager to get the con connectivity information to direct connect to the instance. So we need to know firsthand 
is this a proxy mode or is this a direct mode connection? Because that will dramatically affect the answer. Okay, so it's direct mode. So all they're picking up is just the connection man is the instance connection information, and that just takes milliseconds at most. So you can you can support a large number of clients whacking on the, the connection manager. Now, obviously, if this is on, if this is running on Red Hat Five on a single three eighty six CPU, it's not going to be nearly as fast as as it would be if it was on a more powerful machine. But, um, you know, you, my favorite four letter word is test. I would say, to, you know, at a minimum, you should always have two and you should cluster those together. Like I showed yesterday in my, um, in the connection manager portion of the version 14 badging exam. So you can cluster two different connection managers together within a server group. So if one goes down or one's overloaded, you automatically get an answer from the other connection manager. And, and at that point, the connection manager becomes irrelevant in terms of throughput. And I hope that helps. Anybody else have anything? Looks like we're winding down and just, I think we're done for the day then. Uh, unless anybody has anything else to say, still have, I... we still have one session after this. Don't forget. Okay. What? Oh, what? C fourteen. Yes. That's not and we also time. have the session that, tomorrow. I, yes. yes, I was getting to remind everybody about the tutorials for tomorrow. Thank you, everybody, well, yeah. for coming. And Lester, I'll let you finish up then. Well, I was going to say, this, this has been a great conference. Thank everybody for attending. Thank you guys for uh, being on the spot here and answering these questions. Uh, you, you did an awesome job on this, and I really appreciate that. I, I hope everybody else did. Um, with that, uh, I will say uh, we'll uh, see everybody. Uh, I'm doing the session with uh, Eric at uh, 3.30. And uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow in Scott Beckett's session. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a nice day, too. Thank you. Bye. Bruce, make sure you save the chat, please. That's what I'm doing.